Hello and welcome. I am Yo Soy Ruby Lopez Harper. I am third generation American con raíces en Michoacán, Mexico. I'm a brown skinned, abled cisgender female using the pronoun she, her, ella. I'm wearing prescription glasses, a yellow short sleeve blouse. My dark brown and purple curly hair is pulled back in a side bun. And I'm sitting in my office at home today, surrounded by artwork and inspirational post-it notes. Today, I'm calling in from the unceded lands of the Nacoche Tank, now known as Silver Spring, Maryland. I honor and celebrate all the indigenous communities, their elders past and present, as well as future generations. I honor the generations of displaced and enslaved people that built and continue to build the country that we occupy today. Since our activities are being shared digitally over the internet, I acknowledge the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. I'm using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. I wanna give credit to Adrian Wong of Spiderweb Show in Ontario, Canada, who was the author of the virtual space acknowledgement and to the individuals in my life and circle who continue to inspire examination of practice, responsibility, and language. Uh, if you have not yet taken a moment to learn more about the land you are occupying, I do welcome you to explore native-land-ca, native-land.ca to learn more. It is such an honor to be with all of you today to talk about disaster resources for artists. And before we get started, I also wanted to share that language is vital and so important as we navigate community. In that interest, I may use the term Latina to describe myself, and we'll use terms like people of the global majority and BIPOC to describe individuals who identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color. I want to acknowledge that while these terms do not fully encompass or represent the breadth and depth of ethnicity, racial, and indigeneity, these are the terms I use most commonly in my work, and I encourage uh, you to learn and explore the terms that resonate with your community. During my time at Americans for the Arts, I led the team that assembled a fairly comprehensive terminology bank that might be helpful to you in your work. You can visit americansforthearts.org about Americans for the Arts Cultural Equity Language Bank. And with that, I'm going to share my screen uh, because I do have a few slides and we'll get started with the presentation. So welcome to emergency relief funding and how to access it. Uh, I went over a little bit about who I am. Uh, in addition to my identity as a Mexican mother, uh, woman, artist, dancer, photographer, I also am the executive director of the Craft Emergency Relief Fund and have been doing work in the arts and culture sector for a number of years around disaster management, uh, the local arts agency landscape, and things of that nature. Uh, during our time together, this session will cover tactics to identify areas of opportunity, research funding options, and organize a plan. You'll also receive a, co a companion document uh, that will provide access to a suite of resources and information that we'll be talking about today. Uh, so let's get started. Planning for disasters and emergencies often take time and resources that aren't currently available and sometimes feel out of reach. Not taking the time to upgrade your safety equipment, document your work, or other safeguarding activities could result in harsher circumstances to recover from following a disaster. So we're going to start with one of the uh, really important elements of our work, uh, reviewing and understanding just a really basic overview of disaster management. So typically we begin disaster management with the idea of preparedness or readiness. This typically recognizes the state that individuals or organizations are in before a disaster happens. So this is the time when you would spend learning more about what disasters or situations may be common in the area where you reside or do business or visit as part of your uh, festival practice. 
Uh, it also denotes the, the time in which you would have an opportunity to uh, document your work. Uh, again, improve your safety equipment, uh, ensure that you have proper insurance, different measures that uh, would it would assist you in weathering a disaster more easily. Once a disaster happens, we move into phase two, which is the response period. Response typically involves, uh, you know, either large scale response. So uh, some of you may have heard when uh, the government will announce that, you know, this is a disaster situation or a state will uh, designate a disaster or an emergency uh, period. This typically allows uh, institutional and government agencies to mobilize resources. A lot of times you'll see that when a hurricane or a tornado or a large scale flood, uh, sometimes also in wildfire. So this is when folks come together, they're distributing resources, they're taking stock of damage, they're finding housing, shelter, uh, you know, and, and replacement uh, tends to happen. The response period can feel very intense in the days immediately following, but response can actually take uh, several months uh, to navigate in terms of uh, insurance claims, uh, relief grants, funding that's being distributed, access to resources, things like that. Once the response period starts to kind of stabilize and level off a little bit, we move into the recovery period. This tends to be the time of disaster when artists and organizations are recuperating. So they are replacing equipment that was lost. They're utilizing funds that they've been able to access in order to rebuild a studio or re, you know, start the repair process on a building or the restocking of inventory that was lost. Um, a lot of times, this is also when, you know, people are also uh, replacing, um, as I said, replacing their equipment, replacing, but they're also rebuilding. So if your, you know, studio was completely flooded out, this may be the time where you would then be uh, creating a new, your workspace. Uh, recovery can take years and years and years, depending on the scale of the disaster event, the uh, responsiveness of the relief efforts, and sometimes just the stability of the community in which it happened. And then mitigation starts again to move us back into the in-between time. So that's typically again, where folks are implementing practices and policies that weren't in place prior to the disaster happening. That's when folks are doing additional risk assessment in the event of a, of a new disaster. Uh, that's typically again, a learning process. And so that's kind of the aftermath part. And then we move back into preparedness where folks are regularly checking their, uh, you know, smoke detectors, regularly checking their fire extinguishers, regularly checking the outer perimeter of the properties in which they are functioning to make sure that their readiness, their preparedness measures are intact. And then they are addre actively addressing anything new that might be coming up. So, um, you know, if a, if a scaffolding becomes loose, you want to make sure that you're reattaching that. If you've purchased new patio furniture, you want to make sure that you anchor that down. So in the event, of a hurricane or a tornado or uh, you know any number of things that can happen that those don't then become uh, you know uh, projectiles and and cause more damage. Disasters affecting the arts and culture sector communities across the country, typically there is an event that happens and then what we'll see most commonly is there's damage to property in the event of a natural uh, disaster a you know fire earthquake tornado hurricane we kind of you know mentioned those already there's loss of facilities in some cases if there's a fire and the the buildings burn down or there's a wildfire that moves through and destroys a home in which an artist had their studio this could also be um, that type of a of an outcome there also will be health issues um, you know oftentimes if we're exposed to bacteria through flooding or if there's, um, you know, smoke inhalation or mental health issues because it is a very stressful and traumatic experience to have to navigate a disaster of any magnitude. Um, health issues also tend to be an outcome of uh, a mitigate. Uh, um, 
of an event that's happening. And then obviously loss of income anytime that an organization or an artist is uh, disruptive, their practice is disruptive, there's always a resulting loss of income. So we, we do like to just kind of remind folks that it isn't just the singular thing that you're seeing on TV or that you're hearing about that a lot of these effects can be both immediate but also long term. And so that really does uh, create a lot of the the work and the access and the challenges, I think, that that we see from disaster to disaster, from community to community, um, that a lot of these uh, outcomes also impact different differently depending on level of readiness, where, where and what within the community infrastructure and resources. I always like to touch on just a little bit uh, around personal preparedness, just some basics. Um, this would cover it for an artist, both your personal preparedness, but also your professional preparedness for your practice. A lot of these concepts are uh, pretty applicable in both spaces. So make a kit. Once you've understood what are the most commonly experienced disasters in your state or your community or your region, you make a kit that's appropriate to that type of a um, evacuation situation in the event of um, you know, something were to happen, you have to leave your home, you have to leave your studio, what is it that you're going to need to take with you? We typically recommend a three-day supply of food, a seven-day supply of medicines. Um, I'll mention a little bit more in the resources section, but the American Red Cross Disaster Services typically has some really great resources in the local chapters on things that you should be populating your kit with. Um, um, also FEMA, um, also uh, some of the disaster response organizations and uh, relief organizations will have um, kit recommendations. Make a plan. Um, a lot of times this feels frantic because we haven't thought about what we're going to do if we have a fire. Um, you know, just like schools and just like organizations, uh, having a plan for how you're going to evacuate in the event of uh, happening in your studio or in your workplace or in your home. Uh, where are you going to go? Who are you going to connect with? And um, just making sure that the folks who are part of your plan are aware of the plan. So if the plan has to happen, everybody knows what to do. Secure your inside and your outside, you know, especially for folks in earthquake prone, uh, tornado prone, uh, you want to make sure that you are anchoring anything that could be a projectile or anything that could move and cause injury. When you're looking at your works, you know, your work area, can you uh, anchor your workbench? Can you, um, you know, put your valuable inventory in waterproof totes? Can you lift things up off the floor in the event of flooding? And doing that outside your home as well or outside your workspaces. Uh, and then also just making sure that you regularly check on those things. Be informed. Again, just doing a little bit of Googling can get you to a lot of information, but also being connected to what's happening and what level of disaster response organizing is occurring within the city. Oftentimes, and I'll share again during the resources section, a lot of times government agencies will have a level of disaster response information on their website. So just staying connected, staying informed. If there's organizations that you work with on a regular basis, asking what their disaster plans are can also be really helpful. And then getting involved. Believe it or not, uh, sit, local city governments will often do an organized and orchestrated disaster uh, drill. Um, it's usually every couple of years, sometimes once a year, it's large scale, uh, just depending on the, or the makeup of the community. When I was in Columbus, it was centered on what would happen if there was a disaster at the airport. And they will often ask for volunteers to uh, act as uh, disaster victims in order to test the emergency response infrastructure. So um, sometimes that's a great way and a fun way to learn more about how your city is dealing with and thinking about disaster. But also you can volunteer with groups like the American Red, Qu Red Cross. Uh, disaster services um, are often looking for volunteers as well. And then, you know, if there is a local arts agency that has a disaster response, uh, you know, group or uh, art organization that is a center point in the community, that may also be a way uh, just to create a deeper connection and an awareness of the work um, and, and give you more information and supports. 
So I also like to touch on very briefly what happened, what to do, what to think about after the disaster. So this kind of goes along with the make a plan. The make a plan is about getting ready to go. The This part is about what do you do in getting ready for the thinking about in the aftermath. Um, take a breath because it's always stressful. Contact insurance providers and make sure that they know that you are in the affected area that you've been, you know, give them whatever information, understand what information they might need in the wake of a disaster, document all of the damage that you have. Uh, any loss, and then cross-check that against your records because you're going to need that for documentation um, for any insurance claims or relief potential relief funding. Begin a log or a journal to track activities. Sometimes in the wake of a disaster, you might forget what day it is. And so just jotting down the, the things that might have happened that day to help you keep track of what's going on. And you may be asked for some level of specificity in the event of a claim or a uh, relief application. And then make sure you're getting, um, oh, keep your receipts in the event of reimbursements if you find that that's part of your uh, relief package. Um, and then get support. So find someone who's not in the affected area that can assist you with some really basic tasks like organizing meals, transport, providing transportation, maybe providing shelter or helping you get access to shelter. Um, sometimes just having somebody who just has regular access to the phone that can check in with people for you to let them know that you're safe um, can just be a really helpful uh assistance in the time of a following a disaster. And then um, if you're able to, we highly recommend finding a therapist just to work through some of that mental health, um, you know, the the burden, the anguish, the, the, there's a lot that's going on. Um, and it's always good to just make sure you've got someone supporting your mental health. So one of the things that we talked about having uh, be play an important role in um, first, just kind of understanding how to navigate post-disaster and getting to resources is really getting into the preparedness first, understanding your risk. It can take anywhere from 15 to 15 to an hour, roughly an hour uh, to do a needs assessment. We find it really helpful just to get a sense of, you know, where you are and what it what you may need to Im implement, what you may need, what maybe you haven't thought about that you may need to be thinking about in order to start designing your plan in the preparedness phase. Um, typically, what you'll need if you are comfortable with uh, technology, a, a, a computer, a laptop, a, a tablet, some type of uh, digital device. If you prefer uh, lo-fi, um, grab a pen, grab a piece of paper, um, and then get your artist friends um, to do this with you. And, you know, get your family, get your colleagues. Um, the more people that can contribute to the thought process, the better. Um, you'll start with assessing what your risks are. Write down risks that could affect your practice. Um, start with natural or man-made disasters. So, you know, uh, going back to be informed, do you know what the most common disasters are in your area? If not, do a little Googling um, and then understand how those disasters would affect you and your practice. Um, would a flood or a bad storm affect your ability to sell your work or even get to your work? Um, and then also think about kind of less, uh, large scale, you know, kind of more individual, what effect would a, an injury have or an extended illness? Um, or what if you needed to take a pause and care for a family member? How would that affect your practice um, and your ability to secure and uh, maintain revenue streams from your work? Um, you know, what can you least afford to lose? Make a least list of the things in your practice, your studio, your workspace, um, that you would really struggle to replace. A lot of times, you know, if it's folks that are uh, in pottery working with, you know, clay, it might be the kiln that they've got in their garage, um, you know, things like that. It could also be, um, you know, tools that have been handed down that may be priceless um, or impossible uh, to replace. But you may also need to think about more tangible uh, assets like a mailing list or your, you know, your, your client list. Do you have all of your computer passwords documented? Do you have documentation of the work that you've done, the work that's in your inventory, things like that? 
And then making sure that you're protecting your, you know, we, we kind of use the, the, the word studio, um, but it's interchangeable with practice for a lot of folks and then making sure that you're minimizing those risks. So once you've identified those two lists of things, then you can come up with solutions on how to mitigate the effect of a disaster or uh, how to navigate what to navigate. You know, if you don't have your equipment insured, it's time to pick up the phone and have, make some phone calls to uh, you know, business insurance providers, or even just your, you know, your your home insurance to see what they may be able to recommend in terms of uh, securing appropriate coverage. Um, and then, you know, just making sure things like uh, if you can't, uh, if you can't afford to lose your computer, where are you archiving your digital records um, and storing things either in the cloud or at a safe offsite location? So we're also going to talk a little bit about nat local the differences and sim similarities between local and national disaster relief resources. They do differ greatly based on scale, scope, and availability. So when you're thinking about scale, local disaster relief resources primarily focus on responding to disasters within a specific locality or region. Could be a city, could be county, um, could be even state. Uh, typically, they are a little more limited. Um, um, but they do have resources and personnel available. A lot of times you're going to see relief funding or relief resources, either again through the local American Red Cross chapter, to sometimes through the community foundation, sometimes through city government, sometimes through uh, service agencies, churches, um, folks like that are going to be at that local level, providing that level of response. But on the other hand, national disaster relief resources are designed to address these larger scale disasters that affect multiple regions or potentially the entire country, as we saw uh, during the pandemic. They do tend to have greater capacity and access to more extensive resources, but sometimes they can be a little more difficult and a little more complicated to access. In terms of scope, local disaster relief resources are often more familiar with the specific needs and challenges of their area. So because of proximity, they may understand the, the finer nuances of what's happening in the in their city um, and, and who is most vulnerable or who's been affected in you know, specific ways because they have that, um, that closeness. There may be established relationships with local emergency management agencies, nonprofits and the community organizations. So again, being informed about who's doing what and how they're doing it may give you insight into how all of these pieces and parts are moving together. Uh, and they're also more likely to be involved in the immediate response effort. So search and rescue, emergency shelter, basic necessities, um, and then also just, uh, you know, kind of community cohesion that happens. National disaster relief resources, um, while also they might, you might find them involved in the response effort. So, you know, sometimes you'll see the National Guard get deployed um, as part of a response in, in a locality. They tend to focus more on coordinating and supporting local entities and then providing additional resources and implementing part of the long-term recovery and rebuilding strategies. And then with availability, local disaster relief resources are typically accessible during disasters through local emergency management agencies, fire departments, police departments, and community organizations. Um, sometimes they have their own dedicated funding streams, such as local taxes or emergency management budgets. Um, but sometimes they are mutual aid and folks just coming together from the community in order to try to uh, support folks that are deeply affected, um, especially in lo those local communities. Um, where everyone's been affected, then it starts to scale who was affected more and how do we quickly respond to that, which could then create uh, a limited access to available resources. Um, but then it'll also stress other um, services. It'll stress, you know, not enough shelter if there's, if everybody's been affected. So um, it's always, again, helpful to understand how all of those pieces fit together. And then national disaster relief resources can be accessed through federal agencies. So uh, folks like FEMA, 
the Small Business Administration, but there are also other nonprofit organizations such as the Craft Emergency Relief Fund that provide support at a national level. There are other private foundations, which we'll talk a little bit about um, in a few minutes, um, that also specialize in disaster response and recovery. And all of these come together in all of this way. So you've got your local and your national, you've got scale, scope, and availability, but all of it activates when um, a disaster happens. Um, what's really interesting too is that disaster isn't limited to these large scale events. It's also personal uh, emergency and personal um, uh, experiences that you may also be wanting to find funding for. Um, in some cases, there will be government grants. Um, in some cases, you'll be looking to nonprofit organizations or grant making organizations. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about a coalition of funders and uh, service organizations that may be of assistance um, for those more personal experiences that aren't necessarily related to a large scale disaster. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a minute. Now you get to, get to see all of me. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how to search for grants um, or funding relief for disaster relief. So as I mentioned, there may be government grants. Um, when you're looking at government grants, you want to make sure that you're checking websites of local, state, and national um, government agencies. FEMA is going to be your large uh, federal agency, FEMA.gov, um, but there are also other federal agencies that may be um, deploying emergency relief. Um, the National Endowment for the Arts might be an option, depending on your art form. Uh, national, the National Endowment for the Humanities may also be an option. Um, but you're going to want to look at your city government agency, your county government agency, and your state government agency websites. Um, and I'll mention the um, governor's website later in the presentation. They almost always have some either preparedness information or relief and response information in uh, around disasters. You're going to really want to pay attention to eligibility criteria, application deadlines, and any required documentation. Nonprofit organizations are another uh, avenue to find relief funding and response assistance. Um, you know, research, researching and identifying organizations that align with your specific need or type of disaster that you're dealing with. Um, you can also find support specific to the artistic practice that you're in. In some cases, you're going to want to Google for foundations, corporate giving programs, and disaster-specific nonprofits. Their websites are going to often provide information on grant opportunities, again, application guidelines and deadlines. Um, there are a couple of online grant databases that can be really helpful. Um, Grants.gov, the um, Candid. Uh, you can also just do an online search for uh, grant database and search engines. Um, some of them, you have to pay a membership. Some of them, memberships are covered through your local library system. So check in with your libraries. Uh, and some of them are just open source. So uh, those platforms work similar to a Google where you put in keywords and it'll start um, uh, providing you just lists of funders that meet that criteria. Um, you also want to explore networking and partnerships, again, in, in the idea of being informed, engaging with local community organizations, understanding what your library, uh, local church, maybe the food bank, um, what they're doing and how they're involved in relief response. Um, attend meetings, attend workshops, um, find conferences that may, might be related to disaster management that can also connect you with potential partners and potential um, funding opportunities. And then, um, you know, also if you are involved in kind of these larger scale response efforts as an artist or as an organization, um, you know, often those collaborative efforts can access larger grants and larger resources. So it's always good to start building those partnerships and relationships ahead of time or being involved in those efforts ahead of time so that you understand how that entity or that, you know, collaborative can access the resources in order to support yourselves and your community. There's also the opportunity for local businesses and corporate partnership, corporate sponsorships in the 
um, wake of a disaster, assuming that your local businesses haven't been affected. So um, sometimes that's going to mean that you're building relationships in the next city over because they have an interest in investing in their in their adjacent communities because of, you know, tourist tourism, uh, you know, just sustainability for everyone. Um, so you do want to make sure that you are exploring those relationships. Um, a lot of times your larger corporations are going to have corporate social responsibility initiatives or even disaster response uh, acti activities that may be run out of other cities that may not be affected. So those would still be things that you would want to explore and think about as you're thinking about, um, as you're searching for opportunities. This is all work that you do before the disaster happens for its optimal uh, effect, um, but it's certainly work that you can do post-disaster or you can ask a support person to help you with post-disaster because it can feel pretty daunting. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Share this button. share. Okay, so just some key items to think about when you're preparing your application or your request. So again, research and preparation is going to be the key to all of it. You're going to want to do your Googling. You're going to want to read the guidelines. You're going to want to make sure that you meet the criteria. You're going to ask yourself, is the amount of money I'm applying for going to be worth the amount of effort that I'm going to make putting in this application? This would be both for an individual artist or an arts organization. And then you're going to make sure that you have access to all of the documentation or all of the materials you're going to need to submit as part of that application. Oftentimes in the immediate immediate wake of a disaster, folks are really good about streamlining that application process. As you start to get a little farther away from the disaster, it starts to become more uh, typical practice, which may or may not result in requiring more or more documentation, more narrative, more. So just make sure that you're paying attention um, and going back because maybe something isn't what you want to do at the beginning of, it, of the post-disaster, but it may be something you want to explore six months to a year year to two years from now. Uh, identifying, let's see, identifying. <laughs> so identifying the funding sources is just the result then of your research. So you've researched, you found, you know, 20 different opportunities. You're going to pursue a limited number of those. So let's just say you're going to pick five. So once you've picked your five, you're going to, um, you know, either work with, uh, a family member, a friend, a support person to get the application done. Sometimes you may need access to technology. Again, you may need to be accessing documentation. Um, but having a, a, a buddy to do this with you can be really helpful in terms of, you know, just formulating, reviewing, um, being an extra pair of eyes so that you don't miss a step in the process. Um, so that that just something to think about. Um, making sure that you review the application guidelines. Again, if you do have a buddy that's going through this with you, um, have them read the guidelines because something might stand out to them that you skim, or uh, you might that you might see something and they you know also might be able to help you navigate what that means. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you're allowing plenty of time to go through this process, and it's really difficult in the wake of a disaster to give it the time that it needs to not rush an application, but it is in your best interest not to rush through this part of the process. Um, when funders get these applications and you can really tell that they've just been rushed, it's a balance between wanting to be helpful, but also needing to honor the process that they have in place. Um, Putting together your proposal, you're really going to want to make sure that you um, have as much information available as possible. A lot of times funders are not looking for, um, you know, all of the background in terms of, you know, the kind of what got you there, but they need to know what you do, how you do it, what is it that you're going to need, you know, assistance with, um, is it replacing things, and if you're replacing it, how, you know, what does that mean in the context of, um, uh, of your practice, um, for organizations, it could be in context to your programming or to your service footprint, um, you are going to want to have 
clear budget and financials. And so that may mean that you need to do a little Googling about what it would cost to replace the kiln. What is it going to cost to uh, replace your supplies? Um, and, and that may need to be provided as well. Um, you are going to want to think of all of those things, though. I would I always recommend that folks put in way more than what they think they're going to need. Um, individuals tend to ask for the least amount. Um, and I understand the spirit that comes from. But in this time, it is also about making sure that you are viable. Put your oxygen mask on first. Um, and if that means that you need to ask for um, really minute and specific things, then ask for that. Um, because it also gives funders and it gives kind of the general analysis of what really was affected as a result of this disaster. In terms of application submission, just be mindful of deadlines, be mindful of elements of the application that need to be submitted. Um, make sure, again, that you've given yourself plenty of time to work through that. Uh, I always recommend that you submit early. Don't wait until the last minute because everybody waits until the last minute and that could result in a technology situation um, that could delay your application and then render you ineligible. So I usually suggest that folks try to get the application in, uh, you know, one to three three days ahead of schedule. That way, if you do experience a technology uh, glitch, something happens, you have time to address it. Um, and especially in the time following a disaster, usually there's a lot of movement through funding uh, portals that can create some tension. So um, again, just making sure that you're giving yourself and the folks that are looking to support you enough time to, to be thoughtful in that process. And just some last tips on a successful application. Again, make sure you read the guidelines thoroughly. That's going to be the bulk of the information that you're going to need in order to craft a successful application. Tailor your proposal if you are able to. I understand and acknowledge that in the time of the, you know, in the following of a disaster, the last thing you want to do is thinking about customizing your, your situation. Um, but I think that also comes with making sure that you're approaching the right pot, the right opportunity and not every opportunity. If you do every opportunity, you're probably going to have be creating more work for yourself. Uh, be concise and clear. Just the facts. Um, demonstrate capacity. You know, for me, that one's kind of an interesting thing. I think it's more organizationally applicable than it is artist applicable um, because I think sometimes it, it is important for a funder to see that, um, you know, how is this funding going to help that organization reestablish itself. Um, and so just demonstrating the ability to understand what it's going to mean to navigate that. Um, I don't like the word justify and it slipped by me. So I'm just going to call that out right now. Um, but you really want to make sure that you are able to support and verify the budget that you're submitting. So if somebody says, I need $500 for a kiln, there might be a question versus saying, I need $559.95 to replace this specific kiln. So think of justify as more about support and not having to um, affirm or, uh, you know, um, yeah, I'm missing the word, but you know, it isn't about justifying. It's really about verifying and supporting the budget that you're putting forward for support. Again, have your support person review and proofread your application and then get that application submitted as much ahead of deadline as you are um, able. And then again, each funding source is going to have its own specific requirements and evaluation criteria. Um, if you can tailor your, your approach, make sure that you're following the instructions. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, it's a rough go. Um, understand that uh, supply will always exceed demand in the wake of a, of a disaster, um, but pursuing the opportunities that are most helpful to you um, will also give you some peace of mind. Um, and so I hope that this, uh, this particular section was helpful. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the resources that are available in uh, it, that available nationally, but also in California. So a group that I have been a part of for a number of years now and has provided information um, both for me, but also for the folks that I have supported in different capacities um, in my time in the arts and culture sector has been the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response. They are ha and have been a repository of better practice 
and uh, research and guidance for local communities and individuals uh, who have to navigate a disaster, both all the way through preparedness, relief, response, and mitigation. Um, the National Coalition does have a website, ncaper.org, NCAPER for short. Uh, they are a group of uh, disaster relief focused organizations that support arts and culture. And if you go to their website, you're going to see all of the um, current steering committee members. You can visit their websites to learn more about the work that they're doing. Um, some of them are uh, geographically focused and some of them are national in scope. So uh, it's a really great place to learn a lot about disaster management in the arts. Uh, I also have to uh, put a plug in for the Craft Emergency Relief Fund. Uh, while we are focused primarily on craft and craft artists, a lot of the resources that we have available on our website are applicable to most artistic practices. So if you are uh, a visual artist, if you are a performing artist, there are tools and resources on our website that will help you uh, primarily for planning and preparedness. So our website will be helpful in the lead up to and as you are thinking about your risk and mitigating that risk. Um, and then if you are a craft artist, uh, we will be a, a helpful organization in the event that you experience a disaster. So I do invite you, regardless of your artistic practice, whether you're an organization or not, uh, to visit our website as well and to visit ncaper.org uh, for more information. I'm not quite a thank you yet, but I am gonna stop sharing. So a couple of resources that are really more specific to California. The California Governor's Office of Emergency Services uh, provides disaster response and recovery assistance, including grants and funding programs for local governments, tribes, and nonprofit organizations in California. Uh, C-A-L-O-E-S dot C-A dot gov. There is a specific disaster assistance uh, area of the website. Um, you can access that through the menu, uh, the, the menu bar at the top of the website. Um, their disaster assistance programs offer various forms of financial assistance and resources for individuals, businesses, and communities that are affected by disasters in California. Some examples have included individual assistance programs, small business administration disaster loans, and hazard mitigation grant programs, and they do have a couple of different resources available. Uh, the California Department of Social Services is going to be another resource that you can access. They provide emergency assistance and support to individuals and families facing immediate crisis or disaster-related hardships. They have programs like California Work Opportunity and Responsibility to Kids and Emergency Assistance. Their website is cdss.ca.gov. The California Community Foundation also has disaster relief funds and grants available, uh, calfund.org. The American Red Cross uh, provides disaster response and recovery services, including financial assistance, emergency shelter, food, and supplies. I remember when I, my apartment was flooded in Ohio, it was such a hot mess, and the American Red Cross came out that day and provided cleanup kits and information and vouchers and lots of um, really important help to all of the people that had been affected in the apartment uh, apartment complex. Complex. And there are chapters located throughout California, so you're one, going to want to visit redcross.org uh, local, slash local slash California. Uh, I mentioned the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA.org. They provide disaster assistance and funding at the national level. It does include grants and programs for individuals, businesses, and communities. They have really specific uh, eligibility criteria and are typically tailored to the specific disaster in which they've been deployed. But if you're looking for information before a disaster happens, FEMA.gov is a really great place to go. Uh, the Small Business uh, Administration also offers disaster loans um, and they are available in California, but also across the United States. Uh, SB as in boy, SBA.gov. And then lastly, uh, the National Voluntary 
organizations active in disaster or ENVOAD for short. They are a network of organizations across the country that collaboratively respond to and assist in disaster relief efforts. They provide resources, funding, and support during and after disasters in California and nationwide. Their website is N as in Nancy, V as in Victor, O A D as in dog, dot org, ENVOAD dot org. And then lastly, um, you know, many corporations and foundations have dedicated disaster relief programs that provide funding. Um, and, and so some of those are just going to be really specific to your uh, location. Um, you know, some of them, uh, you know, can include, um, you know, either immediate relief or uh, response uh, programming that may take time over time. Um, and a lot of groups now are also thinking of ways to provide support um, in the wake of the pandemic, which has, you know, has qualified as a disaster. Um, you know, what does that look like as we think about long term recovery? So uh, with that, uh, we are going to wrap this up. I want to say thank you for spending um, this hour with me. Uh, and I hope that you find this information helpful. Um, again, my name is Ruby Lopez Harper, and I have the very distinct honor of serving as the executive director of the Craft Emergency Relief Fund. And I just would like to thank my colleague Hillary and the city of Berkeley for uh, providing this opportunity to share this information today. Thank you so much.